So emptiness is primarily found in the Mahayana tradition, but there are suttas on emptiness in the Pali Canon. The most famous one, probably the one that <clears throat> is most useful for understanding the Buddha's understanding of emptiness is Middle Length Discourse 121, but I'm not going to attempt to talk about that in, in today. Uh, it, it gets a mention in my book, but only a mention. <clears throat> I'm, I'm more going to look at the understanding of emptiness that's taught in the Mahayana tradition, which doesn't contradict what the Buddha was saying, but comes at it at a slightly different angle. Um, you know, we could look at this card like this, or you could look at it like this, you could look at it like this, right? Actually, you could look at the back, you look at the inside. I mean, there's different ways you can look at it, but still the same card. So emptiness basically is things are in, empty of inherent existence. Uh, this is sort of what Sotapai is talking about, right? <laughs> it's just the intersection of a bunch of streams of dependently arising processes. Okay, so there's no inherent existence. So uh, my favorite example is a rainbow. You know what a rainbow is, right? It, but it's not a thing. It's, well... It's sunlight and raindrops and an observer in the right place. You remove any one of those three and you don't have a rainbow. It's a dependently originated process. And what's really interesting is that if you're standing next to somebody and you say, oh, look at the rainbow. And they go, yeah, that's a cool. They're looking at a different rainbow than you are. It's different raindrops that they're seeing that are generating the visual phenomena than the raindrops that are generating the visual phenomena you see, which is actually quite interesting. Okay. And of course, with soda pie, we're going, everything's a rainbow. Everything is empty. It doesn't have inherent existence. It, everything arises dependent on other things. Now, I'm not saying everything arises dependent on everything else, but everything arises dependent on enough other things, which also are dependent on enough other things, that it becomes a huge unitary net or network. <clears throat> Think about a net, a fishing net, right? Each of the nodes is not attached to all the other nodes directly, but it's attached to enough other nodes that you have a unitary object. That's the universe. You're just one of the nodes. You're just one of the points of intersection. One of the, the ideas behind Soda Pie that, that helped me formulate it, in the US, uh, fire departments in a big city will sometimes get together to have contest, you know, I suppose who can put the ladder up the fastest and who can get the hoses off the truck fastest and things like that. In one of the contests, they get a giant rubber ball, like six feet in diameter. And then they get four hoses and they squirt the water at the base of the ball. And if they do it right, they can raise the ball in the air. And I suppose the contest is to see who can raise it the highest or keep it up the longest or something like that. I, I don't know. You can see videos of this on YouTube, of course, because there's videos of everything on YouTube. But the, the idea is, oh, uh, what's supporting the ball? Oops. Yeah, sorry. Um, what's supporting the ball? I mean, it's the streams of water. It's the streams. It's not any one particular water molecule. It's the whole collection that are coming in, in this way. So it's not being supported by anything. It's being supported by, well, all those water molecules. And it's the same with us. So the support for the ball up in the air is empty. 
It has no inherent existence. It's changing. It's fluctuating all the time. The same thing is true for us. And there is a very important sutta in the connected discourses. This is in the Samyutta 1215. I would rate it as one of my top three suttas. Okay, so I'll preempt the, the question. What are the other two? So we talked about one of them, which is the Quarrels and Disputes Sutta, the Sutta Nipata 411. The other one I mentioned briefly, Dignikaya number two. Uh, actually, if you go to my website, uh, leighb.com, and click on suttas, and at the bottom of that page is my, a list of my top 10 sites. A uh, top 10 uh, suttas. And of course, the list has 11 because, yeah, it, my list goes to 11. Anyhow, this is a really important sutta. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was living at Savati, and there the Venerable Kachyana Gota approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, it is said, right view, right view. In what way, venerable sir, is there right view? One of the things that's really important when reading a sutta is to understand to whom the sutta is being given. Because the Buddha would, he's not doing consistent metaphysics. He's not doing metaphysics at all. He would speak to the person he was talking to. And so he would give a different sutta to a Jain than he would give to an Ajivaka or a Brahmin or a lay person or a monk. And so now it's the venerable Katyana Gota. And it's the venerable, it's not some monk or Katyana Gota, it's the venerable Katyana Gota. So we can assume this is a monk of some relatively high standing. Okay, so that's a hint this is going to be an advanced teaching. So he wants to know what is right view. This world Katyana for the most part depends upon a duality upon the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. Now the word literally is the notion of it is and the notion of it is not, right? So Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, does he exist or does he not exist? Well, I mean, if he, has corporal existence, he's in trouble because ice caps are melting and North Pole ain't going to be habitable, right? But, okay, so he's a myth, he's whatever. But if you have a misbehaving two-year-old two weeks before Christmas, all you got to say is Santa Claus is watching and suddenly you got good behavior, right? So non-existent Santa Claus has power. Uh, he rides in the Christmas parades. He sells Coca-Cola. So does he exist or does he not exist? Well, this world for the most part is dependent upon this duality of existence and non-existence. But for one who sees the origin of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no existence of, there's no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. And for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no notion of existence in regard to the world. Basically, if you see the arising and passing of phenomena, you don't get caught up in existence and non-existence. When something arises, you don't think it doesn't exist. And when the same thing ceases, you don't think it does exist. This is another concept right? It's streams, it's verbs, it's changing, and the streams intersect. And if the intersection is not moving real fast, we want to call it existence. And if it's disappearing, we want to say it goes into non-existence, but this is just a concept. This world, Kachana, for the most part, is shackled by engagement, clinging, and adherence. But one with right view does not become engaged and cling through that engagement, mental standpoint, adherence, underlying tendency, 
One with right view does not take a stand about myself. So you sometimes hear the Buddha taught no self. No. He didn't teach self and he didn't teach no self. What he taught was wherever you look, that's not self. It's not your body, not your Vedana, not your concepts, not your thoughts, emotions, memories, not your consciousness. Right? But one with right view does not take a stand about myself. One doesn't say there is a self. One doesn't say there isn't a self. This is because one understands that self is just a concept. It's the interaction of a bunch of streams of definitely arising processes, right? Your whole idea of who you are is a result of all of this stuff that's gone before you in your life. Right? And including your body, your genetic heritage, the food you ate as a kid, all of this stuff feeds into who you are. One with right view has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only dukkha arising, and what ceases is only dukkha ceasing. When I got to this, it was like, what? What's he talking about? You know that chocolate cake I had last night? That was not dukkha. That was delicious. I uh, wish we had some more. I ate the last piece. Right? And the headache I had the other day, it's gone. It's ceasing was not dukkha. When it was there, it was dukkha. So what's going on? Well, there are two ways to interpret this. One is, well, the translation of dukkha. I'm, I'm reading from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. He has suffering because that's how we always translate dukkha. I prefer to see it untranslated. But what if we translate it as not a source of lasting happiness? One has no perplexity of doubt that what arises is not a source of lasting happiness and what ceases is not a source of lasting happiness. Because that's really one of the things about dukkha. The chocolate cake was not a source of lasting happiness because the chocolate cake is gone. Only a memory, no taste left, no cake left. And the headache, it's gone. And yeah, it, it certainly wasn't a source of lasting happiness when it rose. And now that it's gone, well, it might be back. So the fact that it's gone is not necessarily a source of lasting happiness either. Right? So that's one way to, to look at dukkha as not a source of lasting happiness. Another way, and the, the usual Mahayana way of interpreting it is that if you conceptualize anything as a noun, that's a step towards dukkha. In other words, if you give things existence, you're setting yourself up for dukkha. Or if you give things non-existence, you're setting yourself up for dukkha. You're, you're putting things into the categories of existence and non-existence, as opposed to looking at it in terms of everything is empty. Everything is soda pie. Everything is dependently originated. One's knowledge about this is independent of others. One understands this for oneself. One has experienced this one for oneself. My teacher Ayakema said that an insight was an understood experience. So I can tell you all this stuff. Maybe I do a good job of telling you and you do a good job of listening, but until you experience for yourself, it's not an insight. It's just intellectual knowledge. The example that I came and used was mango. If you've never had a mango and somebody describes it to you, it's a fruit, it's got this orange peel on the outside, you peel it, it's orange on the inside, it's got a big stone in the middle, it's juicy, it's sweet. Do you know what a mango tastes like? No, you think it's a peach. Right? You've got to bite into the mango. You've got to have the experience of the mango to know what it tastes like. It's the same thing with this. If you have the experience of the non-existent and non-non-existent nature of the world, either existent or non-existent, if you can experience the world like that, then one's knowledge about this is independent of others. 
In this way, Kachiana, there is right view. All exists, Kachiana, this is one extreme. All does not exist, this is the second extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, a Tathagata teaches the Dhamma via the middle. With this as necessary condition, that arises. If this necessary condition doesn't happen, that does not arise. In other words, the general case of dependent origination. However, that's not what the Sutta says. What the Sutta says is with ignorance as condition, Sankaras arise. With Sankaras as condition, consciousness arises all the way up to with birth as condition, old age, sickness, death, and all the rest of the dukkha arises. With the ceasing of ignorance, this is the ceasing of Sankaras, with the ceasing of Sankaras, the ceasing of consciousness, all the way up to with the ceasing of birth, the ceasing of old age, sickness, and death, and all the rest of the dukkha. But when I started studying this sutta, it was like, you know, that doesn't make any sense to put the 12 links there. What does that have to do with what came before? I wonder if this got stepped on. I wonder if the Buddha said something like this, that conditionality dependent origination. And then I was reading an interesting book by Govind C. Pandi called Studies in the Origin of Buddhism. One of the things he does in there is go through and basically for each sutta, try and determine which of four buckets it falls in. Early, late, composite, or don't know. Well, the big buckets don't know. But when he got to the sutta, he says, this is early, although the last bit appears to have been stepped on. He didn't use stepped on, but it probably said something else. And I was like, yes, somebody else agrees with me. And then one of my friends sent me a copy of the Chinese version of the sutta. And it says there, this is called avoiding the two extremes, the teaching of the middle way, namely, because this exists, that exists, because this arises, that arises, which is this, that conditionality. And then it has the 12 links. So I think what was originally there was just Itapataya Cha, Paticca Samapada, and then you know, remember, this is all chanted. That's how they preserved it. And somebody said, hey, let's put the 12 links in. It'll, it'll make a nice chorus. And so they threw the 12 links in there and stepped on what was really there originally. But the key thing is, don't think in terms of existence. Don't think in terms of non-existence. See the world as nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting. In other words, dependent origination. Now, uh, the person that turned me on to the sutta was a fellow by the name of Nagarjuna, who lived in the second century. He wrote this work called the Mulamayamaka Karika, and it's a treatise on emptiness. I talk about it in my book on dependent origination and emptiness. That's where I get all the emptiness stuff, mostly. If you want to read an excellent book translation of the Mulamayamaka Karika, you want Stephen Batchelor's verses from the center. It's a poetic translation as opposed to a literal translation, but it makes it much easier to begin to get a sense of what Nagarjuna's talking about. I read it about, I don't know, 10 or 12 times before I tackled Jay Garfield's Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, which is a really good literal translation, but I wouldn't have made any sense of all out of it without Stephen Batchelor's help. So get Stephen Batchelor's verses from the center. I just want to give you a couple of quotes from there. In one of the chapters, it's about self. And it discusses the self and how the self is empty. And eventually, Nagarjuna says, you are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither forever fused with them nor separated from them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhists who care for the world. That statement more than anything else led to Sotapai. You are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither forever fused with them nor separated from them. 
This is the death. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. So think about the last salad you ate, that lettuce. Yeah, you're not the same as that lettuce, but you're not separated from it. The nutrition from that lettuce changed who you are, right? And that lettuce didn't arrive there, manifest in your bowl. You bought it from the shop, but somebody brought it to the shop and they brought it from the farmer and the farmer had somebody pick it. And yeah, there's a lot that went into that lettuce becoming part of who you are. And all of it is empty, including you. It's just, well, part of the streams that come together to make you, you. So that's chapter 18 in the Malayama Kakarika. Chapter 24 is the one that the scholars usually like the best. And in that one, Nagarjuna says, everything is empty, including emptiness. Everything is dependently originated. Everything is empty. Emptiness is just another concept. It too is empty. Garfield in his commentary says that Nagarjuna is climbing up the ladders and he gets to the next level and he kicks out the lowest ladder. And when he gets to the highest level of really describing emptiness, he kicks that ladder away too, saying that emptiness is empty. It's equivalent to dependent origination. So everything that we've been talking about today is emptiness. It's the fact that everything in the universe is dependently originated. Everything is empty. Yeah. 